So how does a salesperson make sure that the purpose of their career is not to serve as a warning to others? And my view is we need to learn the, the, the lessons of history um, and understand how selling has evolved, what's going on today and how we need to adapt. And I love Sue's presentation that she had yesterday that went for about a minute. This goes a little longer. But let me just take you through a quick journey of selling and the things I think that we need to learn. So professional selling, in my view, really began post-World War II and the pioneer in this area was Dale Carnegie. And he came up with a sales methodology uh, that got distorted and twisted as time went on and was used to manipulate prospects. His intentions at the beginning were very good. So that, that was valid at the time, but what ended up happening is uh, early psychologists got involved in that methodology as well, and it was really used to try and manipulate people. And I think all of us know that there's no place for manipulation in professional selling today, not just because it's wrong, but also because buyers are smarter than that. Anybody who engages is that in, in that behaviour is just going to become undone. So where things moved on from then, in the early 70s, marketing departments really started to get involved in selling and they started to try and educate salespeople on how to take the features and advantages of product and translate them to actual benefits for customers. And there was this feature, function, advantage, benefit mantra that was hammered into people. Who is, who's been in professional selling long enough to go to sales training courses and have marketing people and product managers hammer you about features, functions and benefits. And yet, yep, there's a lot of hands in the room. And yet there really is a problem with that. Because a benefit is only a benefit if it solves a specific acknowledged problem of the customer. If they don't have a specific acknowledged problem, your alleged benefit is just an interesting feature. So for example, if you were selling a computer system that had massive scalability in it, but the customer was in even keel or crisis business mode, is that of benefit to them? No, people in crisis mode are typically looking for things that improve cash flow for them. That's the thing they typically need at a business level. So you rabbiting on about the fact that this has scale and a lot of headroom in it, when they're not in growth mode, doesn't really translate to a business benefit for them. So it's important to understand their business before you start aligning the features of your product to them. Um, and I was first taught this, that benefits are only benefits uh, if, if, if they solve a specific knowledge business problem, actually by Neil Rackham. And what Neil did in the 80s was he was one of the first people to do a whole lot of uh, research and apply some science to selling. And like the Sales Executive Council is doing today, back then, they did thousands of sales interviews. They went along with salespeople and they tracked the types of questions they were asking and how the conversations were going. And they tracked whether people were asking basic situational questions, you know, how many employees does your company have? What does your company do? The things that annoy buyers greatly, they expect that you have done your research before you turn up. Versus were they asking problem questions and then the implications of those problems. Um, so what he came up with was a concept called spin selling. Um, I'm not using spin as the acronym up here, so rather than situation, I've got the word drivers. I think today we need to understand a customer's business drivers when we go and have the conversation with them and understand the, the industry problems that they face and then their specific ones that we can talk about, the implications of those problems and who's involved in their organisation and especially the consequences for not addressing the problem and then get to what is the business benefit and who cares about it? When we were talking quadrants yesterday, Tom actually said that the fastest way to move to the shop quadrant in the bottom left hand corner was to obsess about competition. And he's right. But I think we need to actually obsess about a competitor. The competitor we must always obsess about is the competitor of do nothing. Because if you obsess about the competitor of do nothing, you then become committed to understanding, well, what's the business value in this decision if the customer goes ahead with me? So if you focus on what happens if they do nothing, you will gravitate towards business value. We should teach all of our salespeople to obsess about that competitor. Yes, they need to be competitively aware about what your or our own unique differentiation is, but not obsess about it. We need to obsess about business value. And the problem with the feature function advantage benefit business model is you'll see over here is that Features are of interest to technical people, functions are of interest to users, advantages are of interest to managers, but only leaders care about benefits. 
And if you're trying to have a feature, function, advantage, benefit conversation with a business leader, you will guaranteed get closed down before you ever get to benefit. They have very short attention spans and they turn off. You are not talking their language. The language of, of business leaders is numbers, is finance, is business benefits, it's outcomes, it's managing risk. They're the conversations that the person needs to have and they need to come to the table as a domain expert so they can add value to the business that they're talking to. This top-down approach, which is what spin selling was really about and it's evolved, other organisations have taken that and evolved it, is really understanding what are your industry business drivers and how do we get to creating business benefits for you. The feature function advantage information is of little consequence to the people that make decisions. And yet, in bid and tender documents, in proposals and sales conversations, most of the dialogue is around those wrong things. 